With rising inflation, bank failures, and massive layoffs across multiple sectors, the future of the economy remains uncertain. It's no wonder the central banks have been getting prepared by stockpiling gold. At ITM Trading, we have spent over 27 years building a team of seasoned researchers and analysts who can help you prepare for any financial crisis. Our experts are ready to provide you with proven strategies to safeguard your wealth and assets in the event of an economic downturn or currency reset, which is frankly inevitable. Don't wait until it's too late. Schedule your free gold and silver strategy call by clicking on the link in the description below. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome our distinguished guest, Robert Kiyosaki, who really needs no introduction, but I must insist on one. Robert Kiyosaki is a renowned Japanese American entrepreneur, businessman, and author. He's the visionary founder behind the Rich Dad Company and the Rich Dad Radio Podcast, and the brilliant mind behind the world's best selling book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. His remarkable contributions have transformed the landscape of personal finance and business education, making a very positive impact on countless lives worldwide. So it's truly a privilege to have you here with us today, Robert. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. You, you know, Andy, Shuck, Andy Shuckman said I had to get on your program. So whatever Andy Shuckman says, I follow. So anyway, I'm honored to be on your program. <laughs> He's fantastic. Yeah. And we were grateful. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. So my, so my first question, you guys, is this, is that uh, as we we're chatting before we came on air, you guys found education here in the States uh, lacking or disappointing. Would you mind clarifying, because that's because that's my hot button is how bad our education is. Would you mind telling me what you found lacking or not satisfactory? Definitely. Yeah. So um, to be to be frank, there's actually quite a few things. It's not just one thing. Um, first of all, we've we've been in the education system in the British curriculum and then as well as in the U.S. we were in the Middle East studying abroad Saudi Arabia UAE and uh, coming to the U.S. specifically for university or should I say college was actually um, something that we got into spent some time doing our work and our classes and then as our eyes begin to open and we start to understand that a lot of what we were learning is not applicable in the real world um, <laughs> for the most part, especially business, for example, investing, finance. It was mostly theoretical. Uh, we started to really connect the dots and it opened our eyes that um, this entire education system that they're strongly pushing for the youth to get into and enroll in university and college is a fraud. That's the truth. And um, yeah. it's not just an opinion. There's data to back this up, but they don't want people to know about it. Um, some people figure it out and they skip it. And some people get in and they they realize, OK, I can do better outside of here instead of wasting time. So one of them is the, the amount of debt it puts students in. Cool. Now, that's just a big one. You know, um, we're in a debt based system, um, but they're actually locking you in for debt for almost the rest of your life. It right. doesn't matter whether you're going to school to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, right. you're stuck with that forever, you know? And um, that's just one aspect of it. But the other thing is the theoretical aspect. So I think a trade school is even more valuable than a university degree, because at least you're learning something practical that you put to use immediately in the real world. So you have all these students now in college studying liberal arts, you know, uh, things like that. And they're thinking they're going to get um, a job immediately because that's what they're promised by the education system will help you facilitate a job, you know, things of that nature. And then they get out. It's a shame, you know, but they get out and they figure out, OK, this is not as easy as they made it sound. And um, it doesn't work out. And that's why there's a high percentage of people that have business degrees. that are working as bartenders. There's a reason for that. You know, right. and I'm not I'm not downplaying any type of uh, degree or hating in any sense, um, but that's just a fact. And uh, we realized that early on and we thought, OK, I'm actually learning more about business from watching and reading books from Robert Kiyosaki, Warren Buffett and different entrepreneurs such as Jim Rickards 
than I am in my business classes. Agreed. And I'm learning more on YouTube. You know, it's an mm -hmm. education system of its own if you know where to look for the right information. And um, yeah. everything I learned back then, besides my mentors, what they taught me, I put to use and was able to achieve success in, you know, different ventures um, in a, at a young age. Well, you know, I agree because the story of Rich Dad, Poor Dad is my uh, rich dad was a man who never went to school. And um, I'm, I'm fourth generation Japanese American and growing up in Hawaii. And so my rich dad, his father died when he was 13. And he'd take over the family business. He was my best friend's father. And my real dad, poor dad, was the head of education for Hawaii. Uh, he ultimately got a PhD from Stanford, went to University of Chicago Northwestern, and he uh, he was a hard advocate for, should I say, education from the university systems, whereas rich dad attended seminars. And so it's kind of interesting being this kid, you know, 10 year old kid. And my rich dad, my poor dad is saying, look at how stupid your best friend's father is, you know, rich dad. He goes to seminars and he doesn't even get a college degree. I'm going, well, maybe he doesn't need one. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, uh, maybe. So when I was a young kid, I was not confused, but just noticing there are two different attitudes towards education and the world. And I tend to agree with you. Um, yeah. You know, the University of Hawaii will take anybody. If you fog the mirror, they'll take you. Yet they rejected me because my grades were so bad and all that. But nonetheless, I still get nominations for Naval Academy, Merch Marine Academy. I accepted the Merch Marine Academy in New York. And it's not that I'm stupid. You know, it's just I had bad grades. And the um, and then from there I I, I flew these in Vietnam. And uh, they don't care what your grades are, you know. It was, how many people can you shoot at once? And so it just became an um, education of doing versus theory. So it's, uh, I'm a, I feel the student loan debt is the biggest heist I've ever seen. It is a number one asset of America today. And of course, that was brought to you by President Barack Obama, who's also from Hawaii. And he's not a poor black kid. He was a rich black kid and went to Punahou School in Hawaii, and I couldn't afford to go to Punahou. So uh, this bullshit that he teaches, you know, it's, it's, it's so fake, it, it makes me sick. But yeah, I am I'm a US you. Marine, and uh, I'll say what I think. I don't and like I, that. I, I don't support like that. Marx. I don't like Marxists. We shot a lot of communists, killed a lot of them, airstrikes all over the place. I went down three times in Vietnam. And I do it again, man. I loved it. I loved fighting. But yeah. you're a real patriot. I had well, no, I had to learn how to. You, you don't learn to fly reading a textbook. Let me tell you something. So, <laughs> and in the, uh, this is the last story I'll tell, I went to flight school in Pennsylvania. I went to school in New York, graduated in '69, and I went to flight school in Pensacola, Florida. I got my wings, and I thought I was a pretty good pilot. Then they ship you out to Camp Pendleton, California, next stop, Vietnam. And then you go into advanced guns. And it's a lesson I learned from my rich dad. He says, always look for the best teacher. So while I'm at Camp Pendleton, these young, they're, they're you know, where most pilots are about 24, 25 years old. And these guys are coming back from Vietnam. And I'm inquiring, you know, who's the best? Who's the best? Who's the best? And I said, the best pilot is this guy, Captain Forrester. I said, that guy can fly. He can shoot. He's got more air medals. He's got more decorations than anybody. He's fearless. So I walked up. I'm a, I'm a, a little buck lieutenant. And I go up to Captain Forrester. And I said, teach me. And Forrester took me out. He taught me. I thought I knew how to fly up till then, but Forrester took me through the paces. I mean, holy moly. I mean, you know, how much you don't know, how much I didn't know as a pilot was shocking. And I'm alive today because I sought out the best teacher. And this guy, Forrester, put me through the paces. 
So like when I tell people I went down three times, they go, oh, big deal, you know. So well, most pilots only go down once, they don't come back. But because of Forrester, because because of great teachers, I'm alive today. So it was Rich Dad and this guy, Captain Forrester, and tremendous respect for education, but I, I have very low respect for teachers. One of the significant factors talking about education and Barack Obama is the pervasive influence over predictive programming through mainstream news propaganda. And it's really, I think, also the manipulation on consequences of historical developments like Project Mockingbird, if you've heard of that. It yeah. was a clandestine operation by Barack Obama, which involved government agencies that aim to control media narratives. And we don't know the extent of its influence, but you know, it's clear that those endeavors have certainly played a role in distorting facts and shaping public perception. Yeah, well, Obama was the guy that made student loan debt, took it to new heights. Mm -hmm. And like today, as Andy Shuckman will always say, student loan debt's the number one asset of um, America today. It's our biggest income source. So we've had to, because our debt is so high, they, they claim it's 32 trillion. It's really about 250 trillion when you include all the problems and things inside there. But I'm not blaming Obama for that but it's because Americans don't protest. You know, mm -hmm. how dare we put young people in debt for the rest of their lives? And you guys said it, there's no debt worse than student loan debt. You know, I, I'm a billion dollars in debt because I inv I use debt to buy real estate. But the real Good estate debt. makes off my debt. But to have 1.8 trillion in student loan debt, we've now screwed our kids. And I mean, yeah. if that, if there's a if that's a criminal clandestine operation, I I, I just can't believe Americans are so freaking naive. They don't say something about it. How dare they do that to our kids? I agree with you, Robert. And another thing that's really a shame is they're still enrolling kids into these education systems college. But here's the thing. You know, with AI becoming a thing, artificial intelligence, um, the shift we're going through, the fourth industrial revolution, a lot of the jobs that these students are studying for in university and getting degrees for are not going to be around in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's and the extremely biggest, shocking, you know. And the biggest hemorrhaging will be teachers. Yeah. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm working with a company out of Dallas that does AI for, for education. Because you know we've all got to stay ahead of everything. Yes. So uh, anyway, yeah, unemployment well, is going to go through the roof, is what we're saying. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to see the national debt of America go through the roof. I wrote this book a while ago with this guy Ted Sedell, who stole my pension. You know, and if if any of you have parents with pensions, I get them that book, "Who Stole My Pension," because. Wall Street has ripped off our pensions like we've never seen. And some of the biggest criminals are in Biden's staff. <laughs> it's funny. Agreed. Yes, yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. This actually ties us into what, what we really also need to talk about is the current global economic landscape. It's posing significant challenges for the United States and the rest of the world. We have insolvency concerns in the banking system coupled with rising inflation and a weakening currency that is no longer in demand as it used to be, these are indeed areas of concern. What is your take on all of this, and where do you see this going? Well, I'm, I'm a U.S. Marine, and we don't hold mince our words. It's called, it's time you bend over and pick up the soap, because you're going to get <laughs> fucked. <laughs> yeah, hopefully everybody heard that, right? Better. <laughs> I, well, I, you know, like, uh, I love the Texas area. I live in Arizona. But uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was turned down by every New York publisher. The editors, this is back in, what year was that now? Anyway, they turned it down saying, when it comes to money, you don't know what you're talking about. And the trouble with these New York book publishers, like Simon & Schuster and Random House and all that, they're all academic A students, if you know what I mean. To yeah. be an editor, you have to be pretty academically savvy. And so what I had to, what I did then was I put my book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, in a car wash in Austin, Texas. 
And this guy named Bill Galvin from Dallas picked it up. And, you know, I had a thousand copies of the book. They weren't selling at all. Nobody wanted the book. And uh, this was 97, 96, 97. And uh, he says, hey, this is Bill Galvin from Dallas. I said, how you doing, Bill? He says, how many books you got? I said, I got a thousand. He says, you want some? He says, I'll take all thousand of them. I said, well, who the F are you, right? You know, I mean, are you, are you Barnes and Noble? Are you Borders Bookstore? Are you uh, Amazon? He says, no, I'm a diamond with the Amway Corporation. We teach capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so Amway picked up my book and that book magically went all over the world, worldwide, without the book system. So there's always, wow. you know, for those who are entrepreneurs, the thing is, you know, Go with your heart, go with what you know, and know there's a market for whatever you're going to say out there or do. Mm -hmm. But because of Amway, uh, my book went worldwide. And then the booksellers, you know, oh, can we sell your book? Can we sell your book? Well, we didn't need to them because we found an alternative distribution system. I mean, you guys know in business, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a system, systems of distribution, what you need. So mm -hmm. that's what I love about capitalism is that there's a will, there's a way. The dynamics are really shifting out here in the States. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, they have to evolve to the landscape and try to navigate with AI. I don't see businesses the way they are today being the same. I see a lot of changes happening in consolidation as well as global corporate governance takeover. Well, it's, you guys said already, AI is going to wipe out, especially teachers. So oh, that's, yeah. why I'm working, that's why I'm working with a company out of Dallas in education. But also the supply chain is knocking down. Uh, all over the world, uh, demand is dropping because, they, you know, as, as uh, Andy Sheckman always talks about, they're, they're shutting down the regional banks, which means there's no credit, you know, money flows from the Fed into the big banks like JP Morgan, Morgan, uh, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. And then it flows down to the small regional banks. Like we have Comerica here and all this. Mm -hmm. And without the small regional banks, there's no money entering the system. Mm -hmm. And when they cut off credit, no money enters the system. So it's drying up. So on the macro level, you have the whole thing going crazy, but in the micro level, mom and pop can't afford anything because their credit cards are maxed out. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so unemployment, as you guys know, is Silicon Valley is laying off tens of thousands of people. And yeah. it's only starting now. Uh, Records was talking about Jim, man, I respect tremendously Jim Records. Mm -hmm. Love that guy. Says, the unemployment has just started. Yep. Now, yep. is that good news or bad news? If you're an entrepreneur, this is good news. And that's the attitude of an entrepreneur, that you don't give a crap which way it's going that there's always an opportunity going each way. Hmm. So right now I'm in the process uh, of starting, you know, since Amway was so good to me, I'm going to start my own network marketing company. Yeah. And that's the, that's the power of being an entrepreneur. It doesn't slow you down at all. I just started with a company. And uh, that, that game behind me is a cash flow board game that came out in 96. And the reason we created that is because, um, that's how I learned. I learned about investing, playing Monopoly, you know, four greenhouses, 1031 tax deferred exchange, red hotels. So I own red hotels. I own 15,000 rental units. And so we created this board game. And so when the economy gets bad, board game sales go up. So entrepreneurs don't think like stupid professors. You know, professors need tenure. You know, in, in many schools, elementary schools across America, you can be a bad teacher and they'll just put you in a rubber room for eight hours a day. It means you, you just don't teach. So they pay you not to teach. That's how corrupt the educational system is. And that's because it's run by the NEA, National Education Association, the largest labor union in America. Those are the guys that got Barack Obama elected, the teachers unions. NEA also stands for National Extortion Association. And so our whole thing is run by communists mm -hmm. because labor unions are communists. That's why this 
1965, I went to went to the academy. I had to read this book here, The Communist Manifesto. Oh, yes. It's only 50 yeah. pages. Everybody, should, every school teacher should read this to find out that you're a, you're a, if you're a professor, you're a communist. Mm -hmm. If you're a, if you belong to a labor union, you're a communist, because that's what all those things that uh, Marx perfected. If you pay taxes, this is what Marx said about taxes. A heavier progressive income tax is necessary for the spread of communism, Karl Marx. So guys like me, I make millions of dollars. I don't pay taxes legally. Yeah, That's legally. education. If you're a communist, you did well in school. Makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, it's kind of funny because there's this saying from Jack Ma, you know, the founder of Alibaba. Right. And I think he said something along the lines. Too. Yeah. 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 Um, but, I think he mentioned something where his dad used to tell him, hey, I want you to not get straight A's in school because a lot of times the the, the straight A students end up working for the B and D students, something right. along those lines. That's kind of interesting. My, because, true. My book is why A students work for C students. <laughs> I didn't like school, as you can tell. Yeah, we, we were in a British curriculum. And when you switch from the British curriculum to the Western school system, you you start to really see real fast what's going on here. Right. <laughs> and they are just taking everyone in a different direction intentionally. Of course. And that, that's why this was my la last book here. It was called the, uh, the, the Communist Man the Capitalist yeah. Manifesto. Mm. But look at how much this book is 50 pages. This is how much I had to write just to counter the damage done by this book here. As, wow. And as I said to you, this is in 1965, I had to read this book here, went to the academy. Military officers are trained differently. And when I was flying this in Vietnam, shooting communists all day long, I, was, I thought I died and went to heaven. <laughs> well hey you you might have an opportunity very soon to come back to the fight again. <laughs> because something's brewing <laughs> you know something is brewing and we can all anticipate it not to mention vindel there's actually a video i want to share robert I, I think you'll find this interesting this just came out and of course it got no media coverage but this is important and we'll, we'll kind of discuss it here in a second now let me say something about this 20 20 election is that Biden is the legitimate president, but he's the legitimate president of what is now the bankrupt U.S. corporation. And that was a treaty in 1871. Well, on September 12, 2018, Trump created an executive order. Within that, he outlined in future elections any kind of foreign or domestic interference specifically for the 2020 election. You know, you know, I sit on a task force at the Department of Defense. And the thing is, they've got the goods. They've got the goods. And Trump knew that if he presented any of the goods early on, we'd have a civil war, that he really felt that the people needed to see how bad it could get. What he's really done is he set up the deep state to come out, and that's why we're seeing all these things. We're familiar with what they've been involved in, all this corruption. There's a lot of things we can't discuss because of censorship. But basically, they have the goods on the Biden administration, and Trump could not reveal that information back in 2020 because it would take the country into a civil war. A lot of questions raised from this because this division that we see in the country today, it seems that's being orchestrated from within. I, I'd agree. I mean, it's, this, is, uh, this is Trump is my really good friend here. Wrote two books together. Wow, so that's amazing. Uh, I know I'm I know I'm very, very well. He's a very good man. His two sons are were even better friends. His, his sons and I was spent we spent uh, we're both hunters. I mean, all three of us are hunters. So we spent time on deserted islands all over the world hunting. And the two boys, you know, there's no water, there's no, you know, it's just no no running water, no we had to pack in our water, pack in our food. And you get to know those kids very well. Good, good young men, as compared to Hunter Biden, who's obviously I, mean, I, I, I have a hard time believing what I read in the press, but the FBI loses his computer. 
Oh, give him a break. That's bullshit. I know. But, it, and, and I mean, what has happened to this country with the FBI? I can't trust the FBI. You guys are afraid of being shut down. I'm afraid of it. You know, I had, I had Eric Trump on my podcast and they shut me down. Just having Eric Trump on my podcast. That was That's Twitter. Ridiculous. That was Twitter. So thank God uh, Elon Musk bought it to bring some capitalism back into Twitter. Hmm. So we're fighting back slowly but surely. Yes. But this country, you know, politics is a really dirty, dirty, dirty game. And I just don't like to get into it. He said, she said. So I kind of just not pay attention to what they say as watch what they do. Right. And I can tell you this much about Biden. He's a criminal, you know, because I watched what he did. His first act. What was his first act? You know what it was? Yeah. The Keystone oh, Pipeline. Keystone Pipeline. The moment he did that, cut off the Keystone that, that Pipeline from Canada to America, under Trump, my friend here, I was selling oil. Mm-hmm. And oil was being sold. I was, my, my oil wells were in Louisiana, Texas, and North Dakota. I was selling oil for $30 a barrel. The moment Biden came online and, and cut off the cut pipeline, oil went from $30 to $130 a barrel. I think today is about 80 or 70 a barrel. But that mm-hmm. caused inflation, and that wiped out mom and pop and all this. So, so Biden intentionally... Caught up all those green new deals, guys. S what S, mm-hmm. ESG, environmental, yeah. social governance, die, diversity, inclusion, equity. Spells die. You all know that I mean? stupid stuff. And and all of this stuff, they're intentionally killing us. So this it's is intentional. A, yeah, this is the rule of thumb I say to you guys. I don't listen to what people say. I watch what they do. And what Biden is doing. It's criminal. So right. you can take me down for that. But cutting off the Keystone Pipeline, he didn't have to do that. And yeah. he's selling he's selling oil out of the strategic reserves and all this. And so you guys are from Saudi Arabia, and that's where the BRICS are joining up against us. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you realize the two biggest oil producers in the world now going against us, Russia and Saudi Arabia? Yep. You know, the two biggest nuclear powers are Russia and China going against America. I mean, yes. all of this is because of Biden. Just watch mm-hmm. what he's done. The reason this is so concerning, though, is because, you know, forget the alleged corruption, but the weaponization of government agencies against its own citizens. This is really a, like his administration it was the start of potentially leading the United States down a path toward a totalitarian technocracy. And, you know, that's where the concern is. What what are the implications for America's future? Because like you said, it's the young people and the older people. They don't stand up anymore. They don't protest. Everyone's on their phone. Everybody's talking about the next football game and just so distracted with stupid TV shows. And don't get me wrong. We all love entertainment, but it's really taking people's eyes off what's going on. And it's affecting them, their families, their lifestyle the standard of living, and it's going to affect their kids even worse. And um, like you said, Robert, with the Keystone, when they cut that off the pipeline, um, that was just like the first domino to really create significant inflation in this country and um, a hardship for the average citizen, because that money used to go back into the economy, to businesses, spending it on things families need. But instead, now they have to cut down on that because they got to spend more on gas. See what I mean? So it's like this domino effect, you know, and then now you got inflation just significantly rising on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I don't know. My my background is oil too. I went to U S merchant Marine Academy in New York. I was a tanker officer and I drove tankers for standard oil of California. So, and that's why as an investor, I don't invest in stocks. I don't, I don't invest in any, I don't, no paper, no stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. I invest in the hard asset. Mm-hmm. So I invest in oil. And so when, when under Trump, it was being pumped at $30 a barrel. So I was happy with that. But I went to 130. I went, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm getting richer. But Biden is crushing the economy. So if we get taken down for that, I'm not saying that's what he, that's what he did. That was his first act. His next yeah. act was to take down the wall 
So fentanyl could come through and sex traffic could come through. Watch yeah. what the man did or is doing rather than what they're saying. And that's why I, I don't understand what they were talking about. I'm going, I'm out, you know? Yeah. Right now they're trying to create a situation by weaponizing the monetary system, not just against the world, but also the people weaponizing the food industry, the pharmaceuticals in order to, how do I say this? They're, they're trying to put us in a situation where people become so dependent on the system that they're trying to introduce. And that's the way I see it. So I, this kind of ties us in. Sorry, please. I, I hate to agree agree with you but i agree with you watch what they do mm -hmm. not what they're saying you guys are young guys if you you know i'm sure you, your demographics are young also yes don't pay attention to words pay attention to actions right and you'll, you'll be a lot happier you know you won't get sucked yeah. into he said she said they said who said oh, the the bullshit. agreed okay yeah, yeah. um so, hey, uh, Robert, I want to ask you this. It ties into the economy. Okay. So I know you're close with Jim Rickards. Um, he has a fantastic book that I read a while back called The Road to Ruin. Okay. <laughs> he specifically talks about the, the banking crisis. Okay. The next one that's going to come. And how there's this thing called an ice nine bank freeze. Right where a um, bank freeze will be put into place with all banks and you won't be able to use ATMs. Um, stock market will be frozen. And there's a group that Barack Obama, along with G20 leaders formed after the 2014 Cyprus banking crisis. And that group they formed was called the financial stability board and in the financial stability board they have a template and a guideline on how to respond to the next banking crisis so this is already a done deal and yeah. it talks about using depositors um, uh, unsecured depositors funds which right. is basically anybody with a bank account okay and that's called a bail-in um, now banks being insolvent I mean, I just want your opinion on this. Do you think that's actually going to happen? Because my background's in banking, and based on all the data I have, I think it is going to happen. Well, it's it a possibility. Put it that you know, it's, it's it's very much a possibility. I agree with Jim about Ice Nine and all that. I also wrote this book here because it's it's been so obvious. It's called Rich Dad's Prophecy. Prophecy. Okay. And once I saw immediately right after the two thousand eight crash. I just not, again, I watched what they were doing, not what they were saying. And immediately right after the 2008 crash, this guy, Ben Bernanke, Fed chairman, mm -hmm. he says, we have a thing called a printing press. And they start printing as much money as possible. And then what happened when COVID hit, they printed as much money as possible. I don't think those are mistakes. Those are intentional to flood the economy, to jack up the price of so-called assets. And then they're going to pull yes. the rug out with who stole my pension. So you guys are young guys, but my generation, boom, boomers, 10,000 are retiring a day. Their 401ks or IRAs, their pensions will be wiped out. And that's going to be ice nine. Mm -hmm. They're going to have no money. The, the ATMs won't work and nothing will work. Yeah. And at that, and then at that point, as you guys know, Saudi Arabia, it's martial law. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? We've yes. already had martial, we've already had martial law. Hand. So it's it's not ordinary time here, and that's why I sit I sit at my desk here, and I'm a you know pilots carry revolvers, and and the reason we carry revolvers is because if you carry a Glock, it takes two hands to rack it. So the revolvers. <laughs> Revolvers is one it's hand. Faster. You, you can shoot with either hand; they're more reliable. But anyway, it's it's <laughs> time. It's time to be. Hopefully, nothing of this will happen. But are you right. prepared for it? It's undeniable that governments around the world are orchestrating intricate moves behind the scenes, meticulously paving the way 
for some sort of unified cross-border reserve currency payment settlement system. As this is unfolding, the scenario, there's a specific technology my brother and I talk a lot about. It's called XRP. And we see it emerging as a formidable contender to the United States reserve currency dollar because it has the liquidity potential to face global debt head on. And it could actually be the antidote to the bank's insolvencies worldwide and level the playing field that would usher in this new era of international monetary dynamics. I'm afraid I've never heard of XRP. And um, I'm, I'm really old fashioned. I own gold mines and silver mines. Mm -hmm. and Physical assets. We, we love that. This, this is money all over the world. 100%. So this, is, this is silver. So I oh, yeah. also have storehouses outside of America, outside the banking system. Mm -hmm. So ladies and gentlemen, all I'm saying here is XRP might work for your generation, but for, for me, Bitcoin's enough. You know, I, I only have 60 of them, but and I, I, yeah, well, I only paid 6,000 for them. But, I, but the reason I could track it was because I took technical trading in the ups and downs of markets. So when Bitcoin came out, it climbed to 20, retraced back down, I think, to 300. Then I had to watch it, it didn't have any momentum and when it hit 6,000, I bought 60 and I'm out. That's so it. I, I never planning on, I never plan on spending it because I have caches of this stuff. This is called gold and this is called silver and this is called toilet paper. Yep. And <laughs> I also own my own jet. Mm -hmm. So, and different passports. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to run. Well, that's Which a really good smart. idea, actually. It's a smart move. Vindel and I, we are huge advocates for physical ownership of precious metals. In fact, I would like to disclose this. 65% of my entire portfolio is in physical gold and silver. That's smart. I do not like IRAs. I don't like any digital form of ETF because a lot of people come to us and they say, we have IRAs, we have ETFs, gold and silver, we're hedged. I disagree. I think it's very risky with the economic uncertainties, cyber attacks. It's 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 not real physical assets. And besides, if these elitists are embracing a digitized existence, and that's the transhumanism agenda, which they are pushing for, you can watch the World Economic Forum, then it is so important to have to, to not overlook the idea of physical ownership of assets because that's what they're trying to do is get us to relinquish it. And that's, I think, where the saying, own nothing and be happy comes from. So, uh, Yeah, we're with you on the gold, silver, 100%. and owning tangible assets, Robert. Um, we, we do the same thing. Yeah. So that's the best move you can make. It's well, it's, the, the point here is, is everybody listening, the question is, what are you doing? What, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. You know, I get so frustrated. I think this is the biggest bargain of all. It's sulfur. It's about 35 silver. bucks for this thing. I remember I was paying $50 for this thing. Yep. So this is still undervalued, but people would still rather save this. I know. That's how that's how brainwashed they are. I'm going, can't you guys see what's happening? No, no, no. I was told to save this. Well, why don't you <laughs> save silver? Why don't you save XRP, Bitcoin? Why are you saving this? when you know they're printing trillions of it right now. Mm -hmm. it's and, yeah. And, and one more thing, you know, student loan debt, I'm making fortunes off of it. All we do is we, we, we restructure the student loan and we pay it off. And then we, 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 uh, I make about 10.25% interest on my money. So as a capitalist, you can do anything you like, but if you don't have a foundation, of financial literacy and all that stuff, which is this game teaches back here, you're always trapped. And th that's why I started this whole program with you. Is what does, what's your education teaching you? Nothing. You're taught to get a job and work hard for this piece of toilet paper. And people will still keep working hard for a piece of toilet paper, saving toilet paper. Do you know how stupid that sounds to me? Do you know how yeah, stupid that's... that sounds to me? 
And it is, you're right, Robert. And the thing is, that's the thing with the education system. They, they keep you smart enough to do the job, but just dumb enough to not step out the box and question things. You know what I mean? Yep. I don't know. Yep. I, <laughs> you don't I, know. Look, I, I make millions. I don't pay taxes legally. So can you sure. guys do that? That's what I do. Not yet. That's <laughs> no, that you're, uh, that's, you're, you're, that's all education, you guys. Definitely. And so I'm enjoying talking to you guys. But if, like I said, what Andy Sheckman recommends you is it's important. But oh. we're, we're, we still live in a capitalist society. And unfortunately, when you go to school, you're taught to think like a Marxist, which is why I hold this book up here. Because I would say 95% of all teachers are Marxists. Mm -hmm. They believe in mm -hmm. labor unions. I don't believe in labor unions. They believe in taxes. I don't believe in taxes and all that stuff here. So that's my poor dad. He was a Marxist. Good man. But as you know, like economics is like a religion. You know, there's there's people who are Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhists. And the trouble is people will kill somebody because they're a different religion. You right. know, sure. what was most tragic and I think uh, was Myanmar. These Christians were shooting Buddhists and they were both. I'm going, why are you killing them? Because they're Buddhists. You hate somebody because they're different than you. What yeah, the fuck wrong. is wrong with us here? So You're that's what absolutely I'm saying. Right. So it's your education. What are you being conditioned to think here? You know, because I, I flew this thing here. I'm glad I did. Shot a lot of people. Wow. You know, I learned a lot out there. I still remember I'd land and I, and I was a carrier based pilot. So we come ashore. And I'd be I'd be in the village and this is outside outside of Da Nang. And I said, those are the VC over there, the Viet Cong. So I went over in my military outfit to go talk to the Viet Cong. I said, How are you guys doing? I said, hey, yeah, how you doing? We we had tea, a couple of beers together. I said, we'll see you back on the battlefield. Roger. <laughs> and we went back to killing each other. And you guys, I, I'll, I'll be careful who I say, but you're a crown prince out there. He's pretty, he's a character, you know? Yes, yes, yes. indeed. We, 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 follow, we follow the Middle East very closely and we get updates regularly. Yeah, so it's it's really a spooky time. And it's a time to think for yourself, but I think you should question what you were taught. Were you taught to get a job and work for this and pay taxes and save this? You know, and Rickers talks about it, not Rickers, but uh, Sheckman talks about it. He says money is flowing outside of the ETF. So like the GLD, you know, the yes. gold ETF. Mm -hmm. To flow money out the back door of GLD, you have to be moving 18 million at a shot. Yeah. So Dark what pool. so what Sheckman is talking about, it's not mom and pop who are moving $18 million worth of gold out the back door. These are major banks. And so that's yeah. So that's yeah. why this 35 bucks today. It's a bargain. August 2023, August 2022nd is the BRICS nation. You run out and buy this. No, you'd rather buy save toilet paper. No and they don't that change. Anymore. That's the problem. They're mm -hmm. still doing as they're told. They work hard, they pay their taxes. They save toilet paper, they invest in toilet paper, and they wonder what's going to happen to my life here. Well, you shouldn't work <laughs> for toilet paper. So that's, that's, so that's why what you guys are doing is a great job. But unless you change your education, what your mommy and daddy told you, you're probably screwed because you're going to work for this. Yeah. Well, Robert, any last words before we let you go? Um, we really appreciate you being on here, but any last words for the audience? No, I mean, this is really a time to start thinking for yourself, but questioning, what the heck were you taught in school? Were you taught by Marxists? So this is the first book I had to read in 1965. I went, I went from Hawaii to school in New York. My, my economics teacher said, gentlemen, we start with this book here. The Communist Manifesto. When you read this book, you'll understand that most school teachers are communists. And when yep. you understand that, then you question what you are taught. And when you do that, 
The next question is, can you change what you think? Can you stop working for this toilet paper? Or are you going to keep saving toilet paper? I mean, how many people I, I say to people, we're going to be a bail-in. They're going to shut the banks down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll get my money out when that happens. You won't that's be able to. It'll yeah, be too that's late. What I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. People are so fucking lazy. They work for this stuff, put this in the bank, and they work for it, and they save it. And they know they're printing trillions. You know what? You know when GameStop went to a billion bucks or something, going, why would you invest in the stock market? It's completely rigged. I yes. own no stocks. The only stocks I own are stocks of my companies that I took public through IPOs on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm a capitalist. Mm -hmm. you now the fast track out there is where I operate from. Most people operate in the rat race in the middle there. That's what you go to school for. So my final words are question what you are taught and can you change? Can you think a different thought and do, take different actions? Most people, the answer is no. And that's what we're here for, to wake people up and spread awareness. Well, yeah. that's one thing, but you got to take action, man. Absolutely. Agreed. Action. We're with you. My, the motto of my the academy I went to was octa non verba, deeds not words. Take action, yeah. do something. Yeah, because you can know about something, but if you're not doing anything about it, it's not making a difference. That's so. what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, you're right, Robert. People listening right now going, well, well, maybe they're wrong. Well, we, we might be wrong, but we also might be right. Hmm. And there's a higher chance we're right. <laughs> so what, is it, what, what does it take to own a couple of million in gold outside the banking system? Not much. Just move it, you know. Yeah, take action. So anyway, you got to be careful who your teachers are. It's like Dave Ramsey always says, live debt free. For the average person, that's really good advice. It's not my advice, though. Yeah, but I agree with you. Advice, like I chose Captain Forrester before I went to Vietnam. And he kicked my butt as a pilot up one side and down the other. And because of him, I'm alive today because I, I had a great teacher, a great teacher in my rich dad. And most people have gone through the American system and most school teachers, as you know, are Marxists now. Why would you listen to them? They probably save money. They probably have a pension and they're probably hoping for retirement. <laughs> Quite a shame. Take different action. Okay. Octa, Definitely. Father, verba. Don't listen to what a person's saying. Watch what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Good luck to you guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Robert. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.